Welcome to Zero Knowledge. I'm your host, Anna Rose. In this podcast, we will be exploring the latest in zero knowledge research and the decentralized web, as well as new paradigms that promise to change the way we interact and transact online. This week, I chat with Michal Sayons and Albert Garetta from the Nethermind team. We find out about the origin story of Nethermind and the place it fills in the ecosystem today. We then dive into the research that the cryptography team has been doing, such as their work on proving the security of Fry, the work identifying security lost when using Fiat Shamir, as well as exploring topics like ZK malleability, ZK aggregation, and the work they are doing to build snarks over rings. This is a pretty research-heavy episode. It was fun to dig in with the team and better understand what security research looks like at Nethermind. Now, before we kick off, I want to share that one of the top sponsors of our recent ZK Summit, Anoma, is on the brink of launching Nomada, a layer one asset agnostic multi-chain privacy solution that seamlessly integrates IBC and Ethereum. Nomada needs you to try out private transactions on their testnet, so head over to blog.nomada.net and join the Nomada Discord to find out how you can help. And we'll add the link in the show notes. Now, Tanya will share a little bit about this week's sponsor. Polygon CDK is the go-to open source chain development kit for building and launching your own ZK-powered Ethereum L2. With a shared ZK bridge, Polygon CDK deployed chains tap built-in access to the liquidity on all CDK chains and public networks like Polygon POS and Polygon ZK EVM. Experience unified block space with the security of ZK. Using Polygon CDK, build chains precisely to your specs from level of decentralization to throughput to cost. And the core devs at Polygon Labs are on track to develop a Type 1 prover. That means existing EVM chains will be able to be upgraded to Ethereum L2s with Polygon CDK. This means more ecosystems, more cross-chain applications, and an enhanced network effects. Polygon CDK is the raw material of Polygon 2.0, an ecosystem of interconnected chains that create a value layer for the internet. Check out wiki.polygon.technology forward slash docs forward slash CDK to start experimenting with your own ZK powered L2 today. So thanks again, Polygon. And now here's our episode. So today I'm here with two members of the Nethermind team, Michal Zayons and Albert Garetta. Welcome to the show, both of you. Hi, it's great to be here. Hello. Yeah, nice to be here. So the reason I wanted to invite you on was I really wanted to understand what Nethermind is. As an org, I feel like maybe I've seen it through a number of iterations, but I remember, like, I've known the name Nethermind for a long time. I remember it being something like around client development for as like Ethereum was trying to move from its ETH1 to ETH2 back in the day. I've known Nethermind as a dev shop, and yet... Every time we do ZK Summit, we get these amazing applications for like ZK cryptography work from your org. And I also see some of your papers being featured in ZK Mesh. And so I just felt like it was a good time to figure out like, what are you guys doing and what is Nethermind? Yeah, you are very right about Nethermind developing Ethereum execution layer client. So because that's how the the company started in 2017. Uh, Basically, our founder, Thomas Steinchak, wanted to code Ethereum uh, client. Uh, He started by by himself. Then in 2018, he got a grant from Ethereum Foundation, uh, and he was able to to, to build a a team of of developers who were working on on this huge project, uh, building, building the Ethereum client. Uh, yeah. Fun fact: uh, the the first like company name was actually Nevermind uh, <laughs> okay. because uh, Thomas didn't want to think about a, a name, uh, but eventually it, it was changed to to Nethermind, uh, what can be explained as a connection between .NET uh, because um, the client is is written in the .NET framework, uh, Ether and Mind. I'm not sure about this Mind part, but. <laughs> It's well, because I, I guess that was the, the leftover from Nevermind. Uh, probably, yes. Cool. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, fast forward to today, and we, we are a company with uh, over 200 people uh, doing like multiple, multiple things. Uh, so we, we have core developers that uh, develop Ethereum execution layer client for, for, for Ethereum, but also for, for Gnosis. 
we develop the StartNet ecosystem. So we have developers who work on StartNet client uh, called Juno, on uh, Blocks Explorer uh, called Voyager. Uh, in past, we, we had uh, Solidity to Cairo Transpiler uh, called Warp. Uh, we do formal verification. We do security audits in Cairo, in, in Solidity. We do DeFi and cryptography research. Uh, we do tech DD for investment funds, blockchain uh, development for enterprises. <laughs> yeah, lot of lot of things. Um, yeah. Yeah, and so so uh, here we are. We can only represent like a very uh, tiny piece of, of the company uh, called cryptography research. Okay, got it. One question here though is like, are you also a dev shop? Like, could a team hire you to build out? a part of their protocol if they needed to. Does that happen? Or do you say you're more hired for like specific research projects or more for auditing? Research, uh, the development and auditing. We have uh, the various teams. Okay, you do do all. And you are building then. Like, but would you also wear the dev shop hat then? And not us personally, uh, yeah, but yeah. other engineers are. Okay. So let's find out a little bit about the two of you, and then we can talk more about the team, the specific team and the work that's come out of that team in Nethermind. Michal, why don't we start off with you? Tell us a little bit about your background. Also, like, when did you get involved in this company? So I started a, in academia. Uh, I was doing a PhD on cryptography at the University of Warsaw. I was working on something called leakage resilient cryptography. So basically, I was analyzing what security guarantees we can have if uh, part of our, for example, secret key uh, got leaked. Uh, so say the adversary or some hacker learned a part of, of the secret key. Uh, after that, I, I switched to, to zero knowledge. I, I moved to Tartu in Estonia. It's like a very tiny, tiny town, but with, with a strong uh, cryptography research group uh, led Ooh. by uh, Helger Lipma. And I started to work on zero knowledge. Uh, that was 2016. Um, wow. We, we worked on uh, shuffle arguments, which are important building block for electronic elections. Uh, but then a Graph 16 paper came out. So we switched our gears to, uh, to, to snarks. Mm, so I, I realized that I was always interested in in security assumptions, in, in modeling security of, of proving systems. And uh, also there was another paper that, that came out in 2016. I, I think like it's a bit less known than Graph 16. It's a paper by Belare, Fuchsbar and Scafuro, where they introduce a concept of subversion resilient zero knowledge proofs. So basically they, uh, they were investigating what security guarantees we can have if the trusted setup that is often required for zero knowledge proofs uh, is generated by a party that, that cannot be trusted. So, so they considered when the trusted setup was generated by, by a prover, whether we can have any soundness in that case, or when the trusted setup is generated by, by the verifier, whether we can have any zero knowledge, any privacy guarantees. Mm. Uh, so, so we had this uh, this paper. We, we had Graph 16. So, what we try to to check is whether Graph 16 is secure when a malicious verifier generates the, the trusted setup for, for for the prover. And long story short, uh, it, it, it is secure. Uh, oh, it is secure. Okay. Yeah, I I, I always like to, to to work in the, in modeling security and also like checking how much we can push uh, a proof system uh, yeah, yeah. Un until it's, it's, got, it's got insecure. Got it. And I have this feeling that this is also reflected in some of the other work we're going to talk about. Yeah. yeah. In 2019, I, I got my first uh, crypto job as crypto, like in cryptocurrencies, as cryptography researcher. And uh, I, I joined a, a company. Uh, I was working on on a system called Zeph, which was uh, we, we tried to to build uh, Zcash on on Ethereum. So wow. I, I can say that I, I was working on a ZK rollup uh, in 2019, but not quite. <laughs> not quite. <laughs> or not was quite. it? 
What was the missing piece then, actually? Why, why would that not have been a roll-up back then? What was, like, the part you were missing? I, I would say it, it was app-specific roll-up. Okay, okay. It was not, like, general computation. Yeah. And then uh, at the beginning of uh, 2022, I, I joined Nethermind to, to build cryptography research team. Nice. And here we are. Cool. Albert, tell me a little bit about your background, what you were doing, and when you joined Nethermind. Yeah, I'm also, I also come from academia. I, I was in academia doing mathematics. My PhD was on studying equations, on algebraic equations in all, all sorts of structures like rings, groups, also monoids, mostly non-commutative stuff. I, I spent several years studying algebraic equations there. I, the, the problems are related to Hilbert's 10th problem, which uh, it's a famous problem where you, you have to find out if there's an algorithm that solves the equations in that structure. And basically, it turns out that in most cases, there's no algorithm. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. And then in um, 2020, I was, I was doing these things, and I was proposed to, to join the Blockchain and Crypto Economy Master, a new master's program that, that was formed in my university, and I started teaching cryptography there. Where were you studying? I was in uh, in the University of the Basque Country at that point. Okay, cool. And I did a PhD in New Jersey at Stevens Institute of Technology. Nice. And what at what point did you join industry? And what made you make that leap? I I, slow, I got slowly pulled into the blockchain world while I was teaching cryptography at this blockchain masters. Okay. And I started uh, getting acquainted with with the area, and I uh, learned about zero knowledge. And eventually I approached Nethermind and joined Michal's team in 2022. Cool. What was it about Nethermind? Like why, given your background, why would you not have gone to one of the like just purely ZK focused teams? What what led you to Nethermind? Well, Nethermind has this great internship program. And I thought I'll join the internship program. It's three months. I'll see what happens. It's industry. Maybe I don't like it. I prefer to write papers. But uh, I tried, and it turns out it was super fun, and I decided to stay. I also wonder, do you feel like because of, I mean, you already mentioned three ecosystems you already work with, Gnosis, Ethereum, StarkNet, I'm sure there's others. When you're working in an org like that, does it mean you can kind of do, you can do like ZK work for a much more broad project base where you're not necessarily tied to certain kind of decisions whereas like had you been part of a zk focused company you would be following the decisions made by that company yes i feel that uh, never mind having this client-based approach allow, allows to work on all sorts of of projects and not take a, a site on some particular technique because sometimes the a technique can become a brand so at never mind we can be very partial with this and analyze whatever we we believe is is interesting to us and we we don't need to commit to it for five years for example yeah so what when did you join albert may 2022 okay so you guys have been there for like a year and a half ish yeah. or like a year a year and a half cool hey we are working with uh with starkware so there's so many interesting cryptography research problems there <laughs> nice okay so i think we've covered somewhat like what kind of company it is, what attracted you to it. Um, you started to mention the different groups and teams. I actually was hoping we could do a bit of a broader look at like, what is the Nethermind world? What are all the types of projects and teams and ecosystems that you've been collaborating with or working with? And I think we've already mentioned Ethereum and Gnosis. You mentioned Starkware, Starknet as well. What else? I can layer. Eigenlayer, okay. Yeah. So that's a new one. Are these like, is this research partners or is this development partnerships? It depends. Uh, with uh, with Eigenlayer and with Starknet is is both. Okay. Research plus uh, plus uh, development building tools. With uh, Nozis, uh, it's more it's more development. Uh, with uh, with Ethereum. Yeah, we, we got some research grants from from Ethereum Foundation as well. We also in the work with with, with Alex Zero. Uh, that's uh, on on the research side. Uh, we are building a private DEX uh, with them. 
Uh, we we are also working with with concrete protocols uh, within the Ethereum ecosystems like like Lido, uh, like like Obol. Cool. All right, so that's a little bit of a map. Let's now talk a little bit more about your particular research group and the themes that you're excited about or interested in today. I think that, that, that there is too many topics that <laughs> that excite us. Let's dig down then. Let's narrow it down to things that are related to the work you do around Starks. So tell us a little bit about the latest research or work in that category to start. In, in Stark related research, uh, we, we work on security of Fry-based uh, Starks or, or Snarks. We, we worked on uh, security loss that comes from, from Fiat Shamir uh, transformation. We worked on run by round soundness. Uh, we worked on non malleability of, of snarks. We worked on efficient uh, proof aggregation uh, of, of snarks, which can be used for single slot finality in Ethereum. Yeah, and you, you're putting all of these still under the Stark category, but some of them are snarks and starks, it seems like. They're kind of, they're potentially also used for, for both. Uh, Fiat Shamir is, is both for snarks and starks because it's like a very, uh, very general technique. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's start with this security for Fry-based protocols. Tell us more about what you're doing there and what are you trying to prove? Let, let me start by, by saying that in, when, we have, when we build a, a snark, we usually need some sort of, of polynomial commitment. Like, and mm -hmm. two most uh, often used polynomial commitments are... KZG and, and Fry. And the thing is that Fry usually is not really a, a polynomial commitment. Mm. So what you mean there is you're sort of, you have to twist it into that format, right? Yes. The, the thing is that Fry can actually be used as a, a polynomial commitment scheme, um, a PCS, if you configure it in a way that makes it uh, very slow, like very inefficient. So if you configure it in a way that you are inside the so-called unique decoding radius, then it's a PCS, but otherwise it's not. And the issue is mainly that Fry is a, a protocol that is supposed to allow you to prove that a map is a low degree polynomial. That's the, the ideal world, but it doesn't really work like that. It allows to prove that a map is close to a low degree polynomial so that, that it coincides with a low degree polynomial on a big set. So the issue is that if you want to use Fry in, in efficient ways, you can only prove that a map is close to some low degree polynomial. So, so you prove that a map is close to a low degree polynomial, and moreover, there are several low degree polynomials that are close to the map. And for technical reasons, this, this makes it um, not a polynomial commitment scheme. Mm. So if you have a so-called PIOP, a polynomial interactive oracle proof, you can't just put Fry in there and, and compile it into a succinct argument because of that. And that, that's one of the, the issues we, we tackled in, in this work. What do you have to do then to make it work? You say, you're saying you can't just plug it in as is. You have to do something. Yes, yeah, so what we did was we described um, a certain class of IOPs or PIOPs. So, so for this white class, this white class includes protocols like Starks and Plunky2. In this case, if you use Fry instead of a polynomial commitment scheme, using Fry preserves the security of the PIOP or IOP. Okay. So the, the price we paid is we had to take a specific form of IOP. And for this specific form, it turns out that you can compile it with Fry. But in general, it's unclear that you can take any IOP and compile it with Fry. Mm. And you're talking about the security of these. So like what you're describing right now is just sort of like how it works. But w was it not secure before? And you had to prove that it was secure? Yeah, what's the security side of this? So to prove security means usually that you, you have some assumption that is widely believed to be secure. And you show that 
if your adversary, if like some bad guy that tries to break your your Zillanor's proof system, that tries to break Fry by, for example, providing a polynomial of of a high degree, uh, the probability that the, the adversary breaks the system is bounded by the probability of the adversary breaking the uh, the security assumption. Okay. So if if the adversary breaks your system, then you can use that that adversary to break some well-known security assumption. What was there before? Like you also sort of mentioned that it affects Starks and Plonky too. So I'm guessing this work came after the release of both of those. Yeah. I'm just trying to, I mean, it's, it sounds like what the work was, was just to like add an extra layer of security and sense basically showing formally why it, why it is secure, whereas it was sort of assumed to be secure. But um, I'm still trying to, exactly understand what the assumption was before, how that was created without having proven it? Yeah, so it was widely believed to be secure. And uh, as you say, our our work is not a surprise because yeah, yeah. everybody was operating under the assumption that the security is, is what it is. Uh, for the case of Instar, or of the Stark protocol, the, the issue with Cry not being a, a PCS, that was already dealt with. So that is not that's not something that applies to like like what I just described. Our these considerations about P Fry not being a PCS doesn't apply to Stark because in the Stark documentation they already dealt with this difficulty. Okay. And in fact, our our techniques build up on on some of the work of Ben Sasson and his collaborators and also of uh, Ulrich Havok when it comes to analyzing Fry as a oh as yeah a from PCS. Polygon. Yeah, he has a very nice summary of, of Fry. The thing that was not proved for the Star protocol was that it is secure after the Fiat Shamir transform. That was a, it was believed to be secure, but it was not proved formally. When it comes to Plonky 2, for example, it was not formally proved that Fry could be used as a PCS. You could argue that Redshift is an academic work that analyzes how to use Fry as a PCS in a PIOP. Yeah. However, the, the security bound provided by Redshift on Plonky 2 is, wouldn't be usable because the security bound of Redshift is exponential on the width of the execution trace. Mm. And in Plonky 2, the execution trace is very wide. Okay. So let me see if I can sort of paraphrase here. So Red, Redshift was the first work that Plonky 2 had taken, like it was sort of using some of the ideas that Redshift had proposed, but Redshift had only created its security bound of a certain size, I guess. Like it was, once you created Plonky 2, you, you had a wider, I don't know if that's the correct term, but like you had a different security bound that you then needed to prove. What they did, unlike Starks, which is like Starks built around Fry from the ground up, like the whole thing has, you know, Starks in, or Fry in mind, whereas Plonky 2 is taking snarks and adding fry using using fry as the polynomial commitment scheme which you're saying you know at times can be a little wonky and so what you were doing here was trying to say actually even though it's using redshift and it's using fry the way it's been constructed remains secure because of xyz yeah that, that's mostly correct i i wouldn't say that plunky 2 uses redshift i think it uses a diff it, it has a subtle difference between from from Redshift, it's not exactly Redshift. Okay. It's more. I would say it's more similar to to the Start protocol than to what Redshift describes, and because of that, it is secure actually. Oh, okay. Because of reasons similar to why Stark is secure. When it comes to the Fry of using Fry as a PCS. I see. Yeah, and the only part you were proving here is Fry. You were not talking about any other parts of the system. Just the fact that they're using Fry as a PCS in their system. Or yeah, was this also an audit of Plonky too? <laughs> it wasn't an audit um, per se, but uh, we did prove its security, and I think it was a gap before it was not known. Okay, cool. Why would you work on that exactly? Like, I guess I'm trying to understand the motivation for this work in a way. Does this come through client work where folks are like, we'd like to prove this? Or is this like curiosity? Is this the open source ethos? Like, I'm just curious. Yeah. What what prompted it? I would say it's curiosity. Really? It's like you, 
you see that there are like missing parts in in the security analysis and and you wonder whether is this thing really secure or or, or not like yeah. what what are the the assumptions that that are used here what is the the level of security what uh, what is the security loss uh, that comes if i apply fiat shamir transformation uh, what happens when we ap- apply fiat shamir transformation to to parallel parallel repetition of of protocol so these were the, the questions we uh, we tried to uh, to answer and, and like for example, for uh, Fiat Shamir security loss, so we, we found answers in, in, in some paper. Uh, but I, I think like uh, in, in general, the, the security loss that, uh, that comes with Fiat Shamir transformation is not very well known to, to the community. So I also like uh, I think that, yeah, l- let's make people aware that actually when they design a protocol uh, and they show security in an in interactive model before, well, the, the, the protocol is compiled to non-interactive using Fiat Shamir transformation, yeah. uh, they actually should have some security margin because Fiat Shamir transformation it's like a quite quite a considerable chunk of wow. uh, of their security. Huh? Is this sort of a bit of a warning that you're saying, or like uh, highlighting that even though Fiat Shamir can be secure, and even though the system underlying can be secure, if you're combining the two of them, there could be some security vulnerability added. Exactly. Like uh, we just need to be aware that Fiat Shamir transformation is not perfect in the sense that. The security of interactive protocol does not usually uh, translate one to one to the security of Fiat Shamir non-interactive protocol. That there is some so, some loss that can can be quite substantial. Are there certain systems that in that work that you did, because you also analyzed security loss of the Fiat Shamir transformation, in that work, did you find some systems suffered more than others, and like what were their properties? We, we found a very nice paper by Atema, Fer, and Kloss that analyzed security loss of, uh, of Fiat Shamir transformation applied to, to parallel repetition of, of protocols. So I would say that uh, if we have uh, protocols that are run in parallel, then this Fiat Shamir transformation cause like a bigger security loss. So, so maybe I, I, I can explain why we want sometimes to run protocols in parallel. So these things from, uh, for example, using small fields, sometimes mm-hmm. there, there are like different ways of, of using small, small fields in, in Starks or, or Snarks. Sometimes we can design a, a Snark or Stark that does not provide the required level of security, but some smaller level. And by parallel composition of this Snark, we can get a security boost. So the security is, is actually better when we run the SNARK in parallel. So, so the idea is that instead of having prover running a single execution of, the, of a SNARK, mm-hmm. we ask the prover to, to run like three instances in, in parallel where challenges are take, take into consideration the, uh, the, the, the whole transcript of all, all threads, all executions. But this improves the security of the system pre Fiat Shamir transformation, right? You're talking about without the transformation, it improved the security. What's an example of this? Is like Nova an example of this or Halo 2 an example or Halo 1 maybe? Plunky 2 can be one of the examples. Uh, However, they they do also some some tricks that uh, that additionally boosts uh, boosts security. I can imagine uh, folding scheme being like... uh, Composed uh, in, in parallel. If we use some very small field uh, and like very small groups, but usually we see we observe uh, parallel compositions in protocols that utilize fry, not not Billner pairings. Um, and I think this this is mostly because in in fry we have uh, with fry or with uh, things like uh, Halo uh, where we use inner product argument. Our design uh, space is much wider, so we can we have like m- much more freedom of saying, okay, uh, I want to work over this uh, this group, 
uh, I want to work over this field. While usually in bilinear curve-based uh, proof systems, there's like a number of of proofs that we pick from. So, so the design space is, is actually much more limited. And, and usually when you work over these, uh, these curves, you are say secure say by default because these curves have like a lot of margin okay. for security. But I want to go back to what you were saying. So you have these parallel composed protocols, which you add the parallels to improve security, but then doing the fiat Shamir transformation can reduce the security. Does it reduce it? Like, what was the analysis? What was what did you what did you learn? So, say say that you have an adversary that breaks your protocol with probability p, okay? And by breaking protocol could mean either that the adversary can convince the, the verifier of a false statement, or maybe the the, the adversary can convince uh, the verifier over a statement that the adversary doesn't know a witness for. We have this probability P. When we do parallel composition of interactive protocols, the, the security of such, uh, such composed protocol is boosted to P to T, where T is the, the number of parallel repetitions, right? So okay. since P is smaller than, than one, P to T is, is, is much smaller than, than P. So what uh, Atema et al, found out is that where you apply fiat Shami transformation for um, such, such protocols, for some class of such protocols, the security is not actually P to T, but is uh, Q to mu times <laughs> like T to T. Totally so different like a, one. Uh, okay. <laughs> so it's like a, a, there is like a big, a big security loss that comes from the fact that well, the, the adversary can, can start the protocol and try multiple challenges by re-randomizing some parts of, of protocol. I don't know if I can follow the nitty gritty of the reasons, but I guess the takeaway is, yes, there is some security loss, potentially. Can, can I give a rule of thumb of what's the security loss of the Fiat Shamir of a repeti repetition protocol? Sure. So suppose the protocol has mu rounds and you repeat it t times. So you need mu times more uh, repetitions to achieve the same level of security as uh, compared to the non-Fiat Shamir case. So if there's three rounds and you repeat it three times in the inter interactive part, the security is p to the three. Okay. If you then apply the Fiat Shamir transform, the security is p. It doesn't. It doesn't increase. Has it taken away any of the benefits of that parallel com composition in a way? Roughly speaking, it, it yeah. It's like if you didn't do parallel repetition at all. It's it's more costly to attack, but um, <laughs> okay. asymptotically speaking, it's, I see. it's as if you didn't do any parallel repetition. If you want to actually achieve PQ security, you have to repeat it nine times if you are going to apply the Fiat Shamir transform, if there's three rounds. Ah, Okay, so this is sort of the, you've, you found some sort of lower threshold where if you go over that in terms of the parallel composition and the number of rounds that you run it, then you actually do see some benefit even through a Fiat Shamir. But then, then it's like the Fiat Shamir just removes any benefits that you've come to achieve through this parallel composition. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But this is a rule of thumb for some particular protocols, maybe what I just said is not exactly true, but in general... For most parameter configurations, that, that's what we found. Interesting. The reason I find this cool is to also understand the type of work you're doing. You're kind of like looking for, I guess, optimal applications of certain techniques, the number of times, which ones go together best. You know, it, it's like you're, you're sort of, you have a lot of different tools, but if you use the wrong tools together, you're going to negate each other's benefits. You have to sort of like think a little bit deeper about how you're combining them. Yeah. Let's go to another uh, problem or like area of research that you've been working on. You sort of mentioned also like the malleability of proof mm -hmm. systems. Tell us a little bit about that and the kind of what kind of research are you doing around that? We usually want to have our snarks to be non-malleable. Uh, that means if, if someone sees uh, a proof for, for a given statement, then 
this person shouldn't be able to to coin, uh, for example, a, a new randomized proof for for that statement, or even like to to build uh, a, a new proof for some related statement. And th this is important in uh, in applications where we use snarks to to show knowledge about something. So one one of the examples could be could be for example a tornado cash. So in tornado cash when you want to withdraw your money, you you need to show that you know some particular secret, you know nullifier and and some secret related to 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 a coin you have in in the pool. Mm -hmm. Um so if if snark that you, you are using to, to show that if the snark was uh, malleable, then someone who eavesdrops uh, over the network can, can take your proof and change it in a, such a way that actually the proof would send money to, to his account instead of, of yours account. It's the malleability of the proof, but is it the malleability of like the note, the actual digital item that you're using as a proof would be altered or is it the proof itself is altered? That, that's a very good question. So you may want to alter either the, the proof itself or the instance and the proof. So instance is, is what, what you are proving using the proof. So for example, in the... Tornado cash uh, example uh, in your instance is your so your, the nullifier of of your note so so this value that makes sure that nobody can double spend uh, cash in uh, tornado cash it's a public information regarding the the tree where the the notes are stored and it's a value which is uh, Ethereum address where the funds should should go. So uh, you built a zero knowledge proof for that, showing that you know a secret corresponding to a node with particular nullifier being in, in particular tree, uh, and, and the transaction should be processed to, to the address that is stated in the, uh, in the instance as well. So if you could mull the, the, this, this instance and proof pair, for example, you could change the address where the funds should be sent to, to some other address. So the attack would be that you eavesdrops communication in the network. You see that someone tries to withdraw their funds. You pick the accompanying proof and you modify the instance and uh, you modify the proof such that the money goes to, to your account instead mm -hmm. of, of, of the account of the person that wanted to withdraw. Uh, so fortunately, in Tornado Cash, uh, it was used Graph 16 proof system, which is to some extent malleable. So for example, you can uh, generate a different proof for, for the say statement. You can re-randomize the proof, like add some well, randomness. Uh, but you cannot change the instance. So, so uh, fortunately, in the, the Tornado Cash example, like no one could steal your, your funds, but uh, it was not shown that this proof system, Graph 16, is actually non-malleable. Non but what was the work then that you were doing? Were you showing mm -hmm. that it is non-malleable or that certain systems mm -hmm. are non-malleable? Mm -hmm. I, I was working on uh, different proof systems. I, I was working on uh, on the Plonk, Marlin. So let's say like the the next generation of of proof system. And yeah, we, we were showing that that they are non malleable non malleable uh -huh. in a, in a very strong sense that you cannot even re randomize the proof. Well, what gives uh, a good good security guarantees, especially when you use your your zero knowledge proof to to show knowledge, and maybe this like maybe you have a system where showing knowledge about some secret gives you access to to some data, right? So so in that case, uh, if the proof system is is malleable, for example, like if you use Graph sixteen and you you want to to get access to to the data, and some some adversary can can take a proof 
generated by by an honest user and just like uh, change a, a few, few few bits, add some some random elements, and also get access to to the data protected by this by, by this proof system. Hmm. Other than like Fry security and all this uh, Stark security, Fiat Shamir, non-malability. We, we also work on, say, a bit more constructive things, so like not, not an, only analyzing security of existing schemes. And one of such projects is, uh, is a joint proof aggregation for, for Starks. Yeah, we, we are working on this with um, a couple of people from Yerevan State University, Aram Jivanian and Haik. Poganisian. I apologize for having butchered their names. <laughs> I had to practice more, sorry. And the the idea is, is the following. So recently there's these folding uh, schemes that came out. And there's a fry based protocols have a incompatible with these folding schemes because all these folding schemes use an additively homomorphic vector commitment scheme or polynomial commitment scheme. Yeah, which is, isn't this like, this is specific to KZG? This is like a property that KZG offers, but that Fry doesn't? Correct, yeah. It's not specific of KZG, but it's something that Fry doesn't have. Okay. Because Fry uses Merkle trees for the vector commitments, and those are definitely not homomorphic. So you cannot just use um, these folding schemes on Fry protocols, but however, there's some we are, we are working on some aggregation methods for for fry based protocols the key observation here is that the fry part of the protocol is very aggregatable and this is thanks to the so called batch fry which is an amazing protocol that allows you to take two functions take a random linear combination of them and then if you apply fry on the random linear combination and you pass you can be certain that the verifier can be certain up to negligible probability that the two original functions are close to a polynomial. What was the name of that? Was it batch fry? Batch like batching? Yes. Okay. Yeah, ba basically you take you want to prove that a collection of maps is close to a polynomial or is a polynomial. It, as I said, we would like that fry proves that things are polynomials, but it only proves that they are close. So what you do is you take a random linear combination of these maps and apply fry on the on the result. This is reminiscent of, of a, folding, uh, a folding scheme because mm. you have several statements and you produce a new statement. And if you verify the new statement, all the previous statements are true. Why did you call it batching fry and not folding fry? Oh, we, we didn't call this. This, <laughs> this is um, a Starkware, Starkware's word. Okay. Well, someone should make the folding fry then. I think it sounds good. And it came out when the folding was not uh, trendy. So Named. Yeah. Okay. There was actually a, fr uh, a folding slash accumulation wording battle. It meant the same thing. And I think folding has sort of like, the, the, the people who created the accumulation line of work, I think have accepted that folding is a little catchier. So they've gone with it. Uh, technically speaking, the batch fry cannot be considered folding if we get into technical okay. talking, but it, it is reminiscent. Okay, okay. It has echoes of it. Yes. So that's one one uh, observation for aggregating uh, Fry-based protocols. But Fry is a sub is a sub protocol of these big uh, protocols. Like Stark pro the Stark protocol uses Fry as a sub protocol. There's a check that checks that the state transition is correct, and then there's batch Fry. This is uh, basically the Stark protocol. So if you want to create two proofs, you can create two proofs that the two straight tra transitions are correct and then fold or badge the fry part. Mm -hmm. And so we, with this scheme, you can basically just fold all the fry checks of several Stark proofs into a single one. Yeah, so, so all these uh, Snarks and Stark have one thing in common, really, that the relations uh, for them are defined over fields. And that actually allows you to do very sophisticated mathematical machinery. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you have like uh, your, um, your tool stack is, is like really enormous for working on, on fields. However, we don't need to limit ourselves only to, to fields. 
uh, sometimes we we don't want to represent our computation as field elements because, for example, in, in CPUs, it's quite natural to represent computation modulo like 2 to the 64, for example, and operations modulo 2 to the 64, they don't make, make a field, they're actually operations over rings. So another topic that we are investigating are snarks where uh, where we are not limited uh, to, to, to relations over fields, but uh, snarks for relations that are defined over rings. When you say rings, though, what, what do you mean? Ring signatures? What is rings? Is this like the thing that Monero uh, was built with or what? Yeah, so so no, no ring signatures. It's an algebraic structure. It's like a field, but not all elements have inverse, multiplicative inverse. A field is a ring where all elements have multiplicative inverses. Okay. But for, uh, uh, the typical ring example is the integers. There's no multiplicative inverses in, in the integers, except for one okay. and minus one, because the multiplicative inverse of two, for example, is one half, but one half is not an integer. You're saying snarks over rings, though. Are you then, like, what is integers the thing you're going over then? Or what what other category of rings are you using? The ma main ring we are interested in is uh, Z modulo 2 to the 64. So basically it's like field arithmetic, but instead of using a prime for the modulo, we want to use 2 to the 64 for the modulo. Mm. And the issue here is that not everything has inverses. Pretty in the weeds for me. I don't know if I'm fully following, <laughs> but... Yeah. The, the, the main uh, blocking point, if you want to work modulo, something that's not a prime, is that you don't have Svart Zippel, which means that polynomials can have hu a huge amount of roots instead of the number of roots being bounded by the degree. And you also don't have univariate polynomial interpolation. Mm. With this, I mean, I sort of understand that you've like, you basically said, I'm going to build a snark over just a different category of numbers and like how what numbers you're allowed to work with but like are you yourselves then just experimenting by building a snark over that and seeing what properties it has are you trying to make a more efficient snark like what's the point of doing that the point is to create a snark that is reasonably efficient and gets around these limitations i just mentioned which limitations in an ideal world we would be able to build a snark that works modulo to, to the 64 for example and it's as fast as the fastest NARC or start you can think of now. If this happens, it means that we can prove computations modulo 2 to the 64 without paying any overhead okay. that currently you pay by transforming the program that works modulo 2 to the 64 to work modulo P. The, the idea for building SNARK or Stark over rings is to, to have more efficient uh, arithmetics modulo 2 to the 64. So, so for example, like uh, that's how like C CPUs uh, perform the, the operations uh, usually. And, and currently we can do uh, operations modulo 2 to the 64 in uh, snarks and starks over, uh, over fields. But uh, we, with every operation, we, we really need to check whether we uh, we got like beyond two, 2 to the 64. So we, every time we, we perform some operation, we need to check whether we need to uh, to reduce modulo 2 to the 64 or uh, or not. Mm. And other application, quite quite natural, uh, is also showing statements about fully homomorphic encryption, for example, uh, because uh, fully homomorphic encryption schemes uh, give uh, ciphertext, which are ring elements. Okay. Right, so you don't need to translate these ring elements into field and then making operations over it, like proving statements like with these translated elements. But you can work, you you could work like natively wow. on the uh, on the elements uh, on the cipher text of uh, from some fully homomorphic encryption schemes. Interesting. Where does this project come from on your side? Like, is this also a curiosity project? Is it sort of like, wow, if we could do this, we could do more stuff with FHE? What's the motivation? I would say motivation is uh, showing uh, statements about 
uh, fully homomorphic encryption efficiently. So say you have some blockchain that w where you perform your operations in an encrypted way and you use fully homomorphic encryption to do, uh, to do that. So by, by using the, the scheme that proves com correctness of computation uh, of some operations over ciphertext, you don't need to perform operations over ciphertext in, in a blockchain because these operations for fully homomorphic encryption schemes can be very com computationally heavy, like especially when you do something called bootstrapping. Uh, but you can offload these computations and make a zero knowledge proof for 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 the computation and verify find this proof on chain right hmm. let me also mention another application which is for floating point arithmetic for floating point arithmetic it's it's much cheaper to to model over a ring so uh, an area that relies on floating point arithmetic is a is the ZKML, for example. So if, okay. if we want to prove statements um, about a model that uses floating points, um, and you have a, a fast SNARK that works over one of these rings, then it's much better because you don't have to translate the floating points into, like the floating point operations, into operations over a field. Interesting. So I feel like everything boils down to a point that we actually do a lot of computations over rings. Sometimes we don't do computations over fields. So it would be only beneficial to have a proof system that natively works for, for rings and don't need to have all the ring elements translated to, to field elements. Hmm. Cool. We are close to time, but I feel like there's so much research to mention. Share, share a few more highlights maybe for us before we sign off. In the research team, we don't always work with zero knowledge. We also work with, with, with protocols. So we work, for example, with Lido, with, uh, with Obol. With, with Lido, we, we are working on making Lido more permissionless, I would say. So, so currently, uh, when you want to be an operator in, in LIDO, you need to be approved by the LIDO DAO. And LIDO wants to make the, this process more permissionless, where everybody can join as an operator. And, and this actually uh, raises a lot of security questions, like questions of, about like, how to maintain the good quality set of, of LIDO operators. So in, in that project, we were working on uh, white uh, labeling protection uh, for, for LIDO. So, so for LIDO, it is essential that LIDO operators run their validators on their own and don't use some um, third party services because such services could be malicious against the protocol, for example, could, could steal MEV or, mm. uh, or, or could introduce a single point of failure. So uh, we were working on uh, uh, providing measures how to detect operators who, who use white label operators. Uh, with, uh, with OBOL, we are working on OBOL v2. So in the current protocol, OBOL allows you to create a cluster for a distributed validator with nodes you, you trust. So if some of the members of the cluster, some operators in the cluster is down, you can basically only politely ask the operator to pick up his job. Uh, and in OBOL v2, actions of the cluster will be accountable. So the operators who perform correctly won't need, for example, to share the reward with an operator that is performing subpar. Mm. Right now we are collaborating with the Starnet Foundation on some open problems around the incentivization of, of the protocol and also cryptographic problems. And um, the cryptographic problems involve, for example, analyzing some conjecture level of security of, of the Stark protocol, um, analyzing how collisions in the hash function that is used, wh whether Finding collisions is actually dangerous or not. How, how dangerous mm -hmm. it is if you manage to find a collision. And also, it's slightly related to our talk about rings, designing a protocol that can work over different types of fields. Okay. Because sometimes you want to combine 
statements about computations that happen on different fields. Cool. So I feel like we're going to wrap up here, but I can tell from talking to both of you that there's so many more bits of research that you're kind of like starting to work on, maybe want to mention. It does seem like the work of Nethermind is just really quite broad. And I think it's pretty cool to see how much the org has evolved and the fact that you're so focused on the ZK community and the ZK topics. I think it's a great kind of addition to our ecosystem. So yeah, thanks for, for being on. Thank you. It was great fun to be here. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thanks. I want to say thank you to the podcast team, Rachel, Henrik, and Tanya, and to our listeners. Thanks for listening.